Now a little bit a bit of anatomy. The first thing I want to talk about is the peritoneum. So this is a membrane that lines the abdominal cavity. I've put in two pictures for you. One's a cross section. And it's this thing in the blue. It's all a membrane. And I pretty much think of this as a bag of tissue. And it's in the abdominal area. It's a bag of tissue. And it contains most of your GI organs. So all, everything, all, almost everything I covered that I talked about. So like that large bowel, small bowel, stomach, liver, all of that is in this bag that's in your abdominal area. Okay. As you can see here, this is another view of this. And you'll see the significance of this because oftentimes you can get fluid that gets that starts getting secreted and it just builds up. And that's ascites. We'll talk about that later. The other thing to note is that there are also structures behind this bag, this peritoneal bag of tissue. And this is called the retroperitoneal structure. So this is the peritoneum. This is that bag of tissue containing most of our GI organs. And behind it, we call it the retroperitoneum. And it contains both non-GI structures as well as GI structures without a mesentery. And the significance of these structures is that, is that if you injure them, you can get bleeding or a hematoma, which is a blood clot, a fat blood clot, in that space that's behind the, the peritoneum. And this is all happening in the abdominal cavity. There's a nice mnemonic to remember all the structures that are retroperitoneal. And it's called sad pucker. You can just read it. I'm just going to read it off to you, but you can pretty much read it yourself and skip it. Skip further to the next part of this video. But it's basically the kidney and the adrenal gland, which is, sits right on top of the kidney. So adrenal gland like right here, right above the kidney. So that's suprarenal glands. You have the aorta and the inferior vena cava. So the aorta would be right here. And the inferior vena cava is right next to it. So that is behind the peritoneum. Now the duodenum, the very first segment, duodenum has four segments. The very first segment actually pokes out and is, part, is retroperitoneal. The pancreas as well, all of it except for the tail is also retroperitoneal. You have ureters that come from the kidney, so obviously the kidney and then the ureters are retroperitoneal. Your ascending and descending colon are retroperitoneal, so those are not in the bag. You're, there's a so there's the ascending colon and then there's a, and the transverse colon and then there's a descending colon. This part and this part are not in that bag of peritoneum. Uh, we talked about kidneys. Esophagus is also not in the peritoneum. It's, it, it's retroperitoneal. And finally, your rectum. Part of it is not in the, peri in the peritoneum. So that's it. This is the more key slide here. This is the layers of the gut wall. Please memorize this. This is super important. Super duper useful. So there's many layers. We're looking at a cross section. This is the lumen where your food will go through. So remember, your, your gut is basically a long, long tube. So this is just one cross section. This can be in the small intestine. This can be in the large intestine. Um, it's all the same, okay? From the very inside, we're starting from the very inside now. We're looking at the mucosa. Okay, the mucosa has three parts. It has the epithelium, the very most inner part. This is lines, right? Lines the lumen. Then you have the lamina propria. This is the connective tissue. And then you have the muscularis mucosa right here. Okay, that's smooth muscle. That's all part of the mucosal layer. Next layer is the submucosal layer, as you can see here, this one right here. This is just more connective tissue, and its function is actually to secrete fluid. And the other important thing to know about it, which is not shown in this slide, it has it has a nerve plexus. It's called the submucosal. Uh, another name for it is the Meisner nerve plexus. And we're we're going to talk about that later, but later. Um, right after this, but basically the GI system has its own nervous system, its own nervous innervation. So that's it for the submucosal system. Next, as we go further out, we have the muscularis externa. That's um, smooth muscle, and this thing is this is doing all that contractility work. It's the function is motility. So muscularis externa is motility. Submucosa is for um, secretion of fluid, okay? So, the muscularis externa itself has two layers. There's the inner layer, and then there's the outer layer. And in between that is the mesenteric plexus. 
So we talked about the submucosal plexus and the submucosa. Now we have the myenteric plexus. I, I called it the wrong name. Myenteric plexus. Another name for that is the Auerbach plexus. And these nerves help innervate the muscles and cause them to contract. Finally, our very outermost layer. This is like the wrapper, the the wrap, um, the what is it? The peel of a, of the fruit. It's called. There's there's two names. It can be either a serosa or an adventitia. And the difference is that the serosa will be present if it's an intraperitoneal organ, and if it's adventitia, that's present if it's extraperitoneal. And so, if it's extraperitoneal, then it will join the organ to the body wall or other structure. So that is all our layers of the gut wall. Again, this is very important. Be sure to know all your layers. No, make sure to know it's mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa, and then serosa slash adventitia. The other key thing to note is an erosion, ignore this, is an erosion versus an ulcer. What does that mean? What is the difference between an erosion and an ulcer? The difference is that basically both of them are just damaged to the layers of this gut wall. The erosion is damage that only involves the superficial mucosa. So it's like damaging this much, okay? That much is damaged. If that only that much is damaged, it's called an erosion. If anything more is damaged, if you go any more deeper, you can go with muscularis mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa, then you have an ulcer. So again, both are damaged to the gut wall. Erosion is only very superficial damage, and ulcer is when you get a little bit more deep damage. Okay, so I talked about, mentioned the plexuses again before. Remember what I called them? Remember there's a submucosal plexus, and then there's the myenteric plexus. So that's part of the, in the enteric nervous system, enteric for the GI system. Um, now, that's part of the autonomic nervous system. I'm going to zoom out a little bit more and say the non-autonomic nervous system has two parts to it. There's the extrinsic component and the intrinsic component. I've already mentioned the intrinsic component to you. I'm going to talk a little bit about that more later. But first, we have the extrinsic component. So that's not extrinsic to the GI tract. So that would be the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. And these act by moderating the enteric nervous system. So they don't act directly and, cause, and change things, they moderate. They change how much the enteric nervous system works. So the parents, um, remember we talked about how parasympathetic is rest and digest, and then sympathetic is that fight or flight. So obviously if it's, paras if it's rest and digest from the parasympathetic, then you have an activating effect of your GI system. You're increasing digestion. And then, and then obviously sympathetic will be the opposite and have an inhibiting effect on the GI tract. So for example, decreased secretion of stuff, uh, enzymes will decrease the motility. So we talked about extrinsic, now we're going to go back to the intri intrinsic component. Remember that's the enteric nervous system. And this can control all functions of the GI tract even in the absence of the extrinsic component. You do not even need the in extrinsic component. Remember that thing can just modulates um, the activity of your intrinsic component. So how this works is that the, the intrinsic enteric nervous system rece receives sensory input from receptors in the gastric mucosa so it can sense maybe different chemicals or different nutrients it can sense stretch from mechanoreceptors uh, food stretching the mucosa it receives modulating input from the extrinsic component and then what it's going to do is going to take all those signals and it's going to send signals that control the the gastric smooth muscle to contract or not contract and um, control the secretory and endocrine cells to maybe release or not release their digestive enzymes. So that is it for our little anatomy and a little bit more physiology of the GI tract.